All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the next In the Cutting Edge Librarianship webinar series, which is a new monthly webinar series um, brought to you by the Library of Michigan, the University of Michigan School of Information with funds made possible in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, we're really tickled. I am so happy that today is here. Uh, what a topic to have on Halloween week, I'm just realizing. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Wendy Stevens here. She is a professor at Jacksonville State University, and she's uh, for several years been really interested in ideas of both data privacy and also um, what it means to grow up is a child how we support um, children in our in our cultural institutions and what is the impact of children of growing up in a world that is increasingly full of tracking tools and tracking devices we are recording this webinar so hopefully you'll be as wowed by it as i am and um and you'll want to share it with others we will send you a note to the a, a link to the recording um, within about 48 hours, and we will post that online so others can take a look. You'll notice that there is a chat window, and I would encourage you to take advantage of the chat window. You can post questions, and I'll keep an eye on them for, for Wendy, and um, you can also share information and links. So again, we're delighted here at the University of Michigan School of Information to have Wendy here today. We are twice as delighted to be partnering with Library of Michigan, and we're so grateful to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, Kristen, for inviting me to talk about this topic. I, if you were here a little early, you might have heard me telling Kristen that there were so many things I wanted to include. So this is just sort of a peppering of, of the, um, the things which have been on my mind uh, for a while. And sometimes I do feel like I'm sort of on the extreme in terms of um, the privacy spectrum. It's something that that is really of concern for me, especially the way that it has um, infiltrated our lives in ways that we may not even be aware of. So sort of contextually, you know, we're now working with, with this group of young people that, you know, are post-11 children. They have never known a world without um, the threats of terrorism, the threats of school shootings. This is just part of their reality. And, you know, from the bulletproof backpacks for elementary school children to, you know, the active shooter drills, um, I'm working on um, a project with our pre-Ks. And one of the pre-K teachers at one of the schools where I'm, I'm talking to, um, to the faculty there specifically ask me to come up with um, some modules to help teach pre-kindergartners about scary situations like lockdowns. And that was just something that, you know, to me seems crazy and age inappropriate, but you know, it's a reality of, of so much of what's going on. And I know, you know, beginning maybe I would say a decade ago, we were fighting the fight about cell phones in schools and the big argument from parents was that they really felt like their children needed to be able to get in touch with them at any point during the day. They wanted that connection to be maintained. And that was really safety was the number one reason that was, um, that was cited for, for students having devices in school and, and keeping them on. So, um, you know, I think if we if we think of that as sort of an environment, then we've got all of these these sorts of issues which are going on behind the scenes, and so many of these are not really visible to us on a day to day basis. Uh, the data mining that some of us were sort of first alerted to when um, Cambridge Analytica was found to be feeding different types of information to different political campaigns to customize ads, facial recognition, which is now you know used for everything from logging into your phone or your laptop to, um, to acting as your boarding pass when you get on a flight. Um, voice recognition, voice search now is um, more than half of online searching is conducted via voice. So when you think about that and you think about um, the artificial intelligence interfaces that have been designed to 
customize their responses based on your inputs. You can kind of see, um, and, and the, the large data sets that are generated from those interactions for, um, for sort of future, future programming purposes. There's a lot to, to think about, especially considering that so many of these devices are presented as almost toys for children. Location tracking is another huge thing that, um, you know, if you're not very careful, you can really disclose a lot of information about yourself that way. Of course, with children, again, it's often situated as a privacy concern, you know, and I always say now people's children are low jacked. And I was talking to one of the undergrads in the class that I taught um, two weeks ago, and he was telling me, He's required to text his parents three times a day. He's a he's a college sophomore. Three times a day, he has to text them. And if he does, he doesn't. Then they usually use Find My iPhone to to see where he is. Um, so you know, th these are things which are are kind of students are even bringing with them into the college campus. Which for someone like me who you know grew up in in was a teenager and then a college student in an age of autonomy, it just seems um, kind of shocking. You may have heard the, the expression that now your data is more valuable than oil. It is a huge industry. And um, it, as you can tell from this infographic, a lot of the value that's assigned to that is based on specifics associated with individuals. And sometimes that's going to be actually sold from sites like WebMD, which does associate um, the conditions which you search for, which, you know, might, you might be searching for those, you know, for a friend or a family member or, you know, heaven forbid, out of idle curiosity. But w once those things are associated with you, you might find that products associated with different conditions tend to pop up sort of in different venues. And in the fact that, um, particularly when, um, with travel sites, uh, the fact that um, you're on a specific computer with a specific operating system and will influence the the actual prices that you retrieve um, when you do commercial transactions online. So there's a lot that's going on there and a lot of it is pretty much invisible to the end user. Now, kind of in addition to the whole Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, um, campaign information controversy. Around the same time, um, you know, a lot of these really incendiary ads were posted um, in Myanmar within their, their um, sort of ethnic conflicts there. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, well beyond influencing democratic political processes. We're talking about things which are actually inciting violence. So, um, you know, and, and this is, again, very targeted based on different types of communities and associations that individuals may have, um, have, have shown preferences for online, or it may just be because their social group is associated with those type of, of um, traits. This is now, you know, I, I do think that there are good things that come out of the, these types of digital tools and use of them. One of them, and I think this is your really interesting, um, uh, for example, um, and I, I think I was a slide ahead when I was what I was going to segue into, but, um, but the anti pipeline activists um, who were, had their images captured via um, protest pictures and who had joined different political groups associated with that. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of political pressure um, on, on um, Facebook to turn over identifying information about these people um, to, to uh, branches of the local government, basically for prosecution. So when you think about that, that you can be doing something that you feel, you know, is politically um, in the best interest of, of yourself, your children, the future of the world, and yet, you know, just being in that place at that time and participating in, in what is, you know, a peaceful democratic um, right to, to demonstrate, you know, it's kind of scary. Now, I actually had a colleague that um, had a baby 
took some pictures of the baby, noticed that there were some issues with the way that the baby's eyes um, looked in the photographs. And because she was so early in that child's life, she was really able to intercede and prevent what would have been sort of a really degenerative congenital condition from affecting her child. So, you know, I think that is one case where, you know, sharing of information and sharing of, of images and sort of analysis via photo has proven extremely valuable. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, it's not like I, I think that everybody should go retreat into, into a cave and get rid of all of their, their connected devices and their um, electronic cameras. I do think that there are positive things. What I'm more concerned about are the things that, that we may not even be aware of what's going on. And, and for example, you know, I know now these connected doorbells are such a huge thing. The fact that you can get a video feed of whoever happens to be at your door. But if you notice, more and more news reports are, um, are attributing identifying criminals or tracking things going on in the area, not necessarily from the, the door, doorbell of the person in question, but from neighborhood neighbors. So basically we're creating this grid of cameras ourselves, you know, thinking that we're really only capturing, you know, people who are coming onto our property, but in reality, we're basically building sort of a larger um, hive view of our neighborhood and communities, which really allow people to be tracked in a way that, you know, if you're talking, if you're contextualizing it and saying for criminals, trespass, that sort of thing, it sounds great, right? But we have to think about sort of what the long-term implications are when you can recognize individuals and they're personally identifiable and they're going about their daily business and um and sort of the the potential for abuses especially in political situations that way this was a recent story in the detroit free press and i just thought it was absolutely fascinating you know we all know about the word deficit that so many children who don't come from advantaged backgrounds tend to have but this is um a program which tracks the number of words that parents say to their children. You know, this seems to me like only a small step from this to saying, you're not saying enough words to your child. You know, they need to have another caregiver. Um, so, you know, I think what started off with good intentions in, in increasing the amount of vocabulary that children would have before school actually ends up being, um, being problematic because of, of the potential for that information to be misused. Um, and similar sorts of things, you know, you may remember I spent a little time in, um, in Michigan where Kristen is, and I remember there um, the, the bookstore used to sell sort of purpose-built digital devices for students to use to respond to questions in class. And I think the main question in class was, you know, are you here, are you present? It was used for large lecture classes as a sort of proof of attendance. And this is a case where recently um, a professor developed his own app sort of with the same functionality, uh, the idea being that it would be loaded onto, um, onto the student's device and include some location tracking. So when you think about that, you know, yes, you can check in. Yes, you physically have to be there. It's not like one person is going to be able to have you know, multiple devices and, and check them in unless they physically have that phone, which so many people are never going to, um, to turn loose of. Another thing I, I noticed, you know, when I was a high school librarian, it was already a big trend for students to have multiple phones. And, you know, if they were um, caught or reprimanded for having a phone and asked to turn it in, they would not turn in their actual phone. They would turn in sort of a dummy phone. And, um, you know, I, again, I think that's, that's sort of a um, one way that students have found to sort of work around this, which we'll be talking about that a little bit more. This is one thing that does kind of excite me, this whole idea that the FTC is really going to look at some of the ed tech things which are going on, which are collecting um, student information. One of the things I myself am the most, um, most curious about, 
a lot of schools of education now are requiring the ed tpa process which is run through pearson it's very similar to the national board certification process for um certification of of teachers the initial certification and when i think about that you know um they they really stress panning the room you know seeing whether or not student engagement is going on and with the the quality of video that you're encouraged to upload because it is an upload process now it's not just you know a burn to dvd process eventually they could they could be able to track individual students from classroom to classroom and this whole idea of engagement and tracking um tracking students is something that kind of keeps coming up again and again trying to come up with these biometric markers for attention and figuring out sort of how um how students are the extent to which students are engaging with content uh you know last year i think was the first year that i really saw a lot of pushback about connected toys whether or not you know it's something that you um can connect to the internet for um, updates, something like the, the Amazon tablets, which allow you to set screen time, but which are phoning home. And if you've never looked at the patents for the, the Kindle device, it's a really a fascinating thing to look, look at because they really um, look at reading speed and they try to group the um it, so basically they're going to adjust their recommendations to you based on what they feel like your readability level is and they there is some some verbiage in there about the fact that you know some people may be reading some things for pleasure they may be reading other things for pedagogical reasons and um and talking about how you know the, those types of reading vary but the whole idea that um that you know they're not just making a prediction of how long it's going to take for you to finish a book they're actually going to alter their recommendations based on the pace at which you went through a book whether or not you finished it and and their their measure of readability of it so um a lot of data is being is being captured and when you think about the number of school settings that are using, you know, these type of integrated learning systems and the amount of data that they can um, can transfer. It, it really is a considerable thing. Another um, another concern is, you know, the, the most labor intensive courses, especially on, on college campuses, but you know, also in secondary schools, are those that require um, grading writing. And the whole idea that artificial intelligence similar to running a grammar and spelling check might do a better job at assessing um, at student student writing ability than an actual person um, you know think about the number of educators that that would displace think about um, you know I, I really feel like we're we're in this push to kind of teacher proof a lot of the curriculum and so much of what's described as you know personalized learning is really just computerized learning and they're, they're saying it's personalized because it, it you know is deliverable on on different levels based on given metrics but they don't have that interaction with the student to sort of check for for other types of understanding that might be um expressed through multiple choice or or sort of the types of essays that would be graded by artificial intelligence one thing that i know i i've kind of watched closely and this this sort of came um came on the scene a couple years ago when um when amazon introduced a camera that it i it said was to recommend um fashion choices as you got dressed you would get dressed and take a picture and it would suggest you add a scarf or jacket or or whatever you know to to improve improve your outfit type of thing and a lot of the pushback around that initially was the fact that through these very sort of subtle physical changes, you can diagnose things like pregnancy or chronic illness, and even via a person's gait and movement, um, you know, their their artificial intelligence is very good at um, at predicting whether or not some at predicting someone's sexual orientation. 
This is a really fascinating survey that has been um, repeated several times. It started with sort of a, um, a data set which was collected from, from dating services. And they used um, artificial intelligence to assign um, sexuality um, preferences based on markers in the images. And they really tried to control for everything that they could think of. You know, for one, one of the things that they, they talked about was the fact that well, straight women are more likely to wear eyeshadow, so we're not going to be considering that in our in our analysis. Another thing they said was more vibrant backgrounds may represent, you know, um, sexual preferences. So we're going to exclude that. So again and again and again. But what what amazed me was even if they blur the faces of the individuals, they're still able to um, to at a rate much better than a coin, coin toss predict um, sexual preferences. And, you know, in a lot of countries, this is, this is still a very sensitive thing. There are many countries where, um, you know, homosexuality is treated very, um, very terribly. So when you think about that, you know, you see the, the potential for abuse with these, these types of technologies. Another one, you know, there have been so many apps that have been found to be gathering and selling information. Realtor.com, you know, selling the email addresses and the, the home values that individuals were, um, were looking at. I think most notoriously, some of these, um, these apps that women were using to track, to track their monthly cycles um, were used basically to target ads with the sort of stereotypical things that women are, are thought to want at particular times of the month. But the whole idea was, you know, I think you have the feeling that when something is, is on your phone and you're interacting with it that way, that that data is not being shared outside your, um, outside your immediate circle. I've been doing a lot of work on sort of social emotional learning lately. And one of the projects it's called ruler uses a thing called a mood meter. And, um, and there are paper-based mood meters where students can, can use this sort of um, hundred square grid to determine, you know, how they're feeling on a particular day. The whole idea being if they can sort of name their, um, name their emotions and then they'll be better able to process them and sort of deal with them. But there's also an app-based version and think about the potential for abuse on that. I've also had students show me apps that, um, where you sort of, track your own mental health or your own um, diet. And, and again, the potential for abuse on those is considerable. Um, and and why, how, are, how are we doing this? And the reason I wanted to include this picture is because of, you know, this culture that so many young people are existing within where they're taking, you know, dozens of selfies a day. They're Snapchatting, you know, for, for long periods of time a day. And, and they're really feeding, um, feeding the beast in terms of the, um, the facial recognition tools, which it, are becoming more and more um, sort of uh, sharper in their abilities to identify individuals. As what, I, I like this one because it actually suggests some, some, um, some social stenography type approaches. Um, but this is, looks at, you know, how insurance is, is looking at people's social media and determining rates based on that. So, you know, if you express yourself as someone who's interested in physical fitness and health by going to the gym with your phone, that's a positive. But if you visit a bar, you might not want to bring your phone. Um, I've always said this about Foursquare, you know, when Foursquare first came out, it seemed like such a fun thing. But then eventually I thought, you know, if you're checking into a pizza parlor at eight o'clock at night, you know, what is that really indicating about your health and, and wellness and that sort of thing? Um, but look at this too. If you're running, it, that's considered to be a riskier sport. And um, you're like, you kind of have to weigh, weigh the trade-offs as far as that goes. And since Instagram is such a huge thing now, you know, I would say that and TikTok amongst teens are really the two platforms right now that, that seem to have a tremendous um, dominance that maybe Snapchat, but I feel like Snapchat's kind of on the wane. But um, the whole idea that the conspiracy theories that we knew were traveling around Facebook and 
you know, even back to MySpace, are now really taking root in in Instagram and YouTube as well. You know, there's um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of things that you you start with something that's relatively benign, but because attention is so commodified. Your, your, the next video that auto plays or the next account that it suggests that you follow might necessarily be a little bit more, um, a little bit more edgy. So, you know, I thought this was a good quote. Um, middle schoolers, you know, they might be intrigued by this notion that Taylor Swift isn't who she says that she is, but, um, but then that might lead them to sort of more dangerous, um, dangerous ideas about different, um, different issues. And I think we've seen this a lot with adults with the, um, the anti-vaccination movement as well. Um, so again, you know, Instagram seems to be a big place for, um, for sort of politicization of presence at the moment. Um, and I, I really think that, you know, a lot of people don't even realize that it's owned by Facebook and it has a lot of the same um, consumer imperatives and concerns that, that Facebook does have. Now, I think the biggest threat to privacy beyond social media, the thing that is more difficult to opt out of, and Kristen and I were talking about this as, as we started, you might have heard us say it, is, um, is really this idea of facial recognition, right? So um, the idea that, you know, we all have these sort of unique data points in our face that make us... Um, that make us recognizable, and when you couple that with motion, you become even more um, more able to be specific about that. And there have been a lot of sort of high profile cases of use of this. One of them is Taylor Swift used this to um, to identify people who were known to be sort of threats to her at her conference at her concerts. So when you think about that, that sounds like a good thing. You know, it's scanning, scanning the people who are coming into the, the performance area, looking for people who, um, who you know, might ha have posed, um, posed an issue to her in the past. And I thought this was really interesting. So the most recent royal wedding, um, you know, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, their wedding, um, they used biometrics to identify the, um, the guests, not because of this idea that they might be a threat, but out of expediency in terms of analyzing who was there and sort of um, reporting that as, as, as when you would have had a commentator at one point in time talking about people walking into that space, it was sort of shifted to this, um, this, this AI model. I was telling Kristen, um, I had this experience for the first time this month um, where I had to walk onto um, an international flight and they scanned my face instead of scanning my passport. And um, because on my passport picture, my hair is down, I don't have on glasses and I had, you know, a different makeup and I had my hair back and my glasses on they scanned my face three times and it never matched. So I was actually the last person on the plane because they had to manually enter my passport information. So I just thought it was, it was very interesting that, that they didn't even have to scan it. You know, they just, these people were just walking up. They weren't scanning their boarding passes and walking onto the plane. Um, and this is something that there, there have been a lot of, a lot of concerns and a lot of lawsuits around this already. So the facial recognition databases, you know, the biggest in the world is obviously Facebook's deep face. I'm not on Facebook, but I am told that if I'm in a picture on Facebook, it already knows who I am. You know, of course, it knows all my connections from all the people who have uploaded all the contacts in their email or their phone as they've um, either created or updated their Facebook account. Uh, there are some tools for opting out of um, facial recognition, but again, you have to be sort of in that ecosystem to do this. But there are many other projects which are basically doing the same thing. Amazon recognition is one that claims that it doesn't even have to see your face. So it can see the back of your head and, or in, and supposedly be able to track you Evidently, this is going on in a lot of places, casinos to, um, to identify people who are problem gamblers, people who are suspected shoplifters. There are a bunch of databases that have been developed to alert different um, bricks and mortar businesses about the potential for problematic people being in the space. 
another data set is um, derived in part from Flickr, you know, re remember Flickr? Um, and it's called Megaface. And this is, this is sort of a typical example in that this family uploaded pictures of their children, kind of forgot that they even had the account. And now those are part of this, um, of this huge database that is used to track protesters and um, surveil people that might be suspected of terrorism. So obviously, you know, this tool is sort of ripe for abuse. It is a threat to privacy, civil liberties, and, you know, this is a really, I, I think, persuasive argument that we should just ban it as a technology altogether, that it's too much of, of an invasion of privacy. Um, and, and then when you look at sort of how these things are developed and, and how they work, you may have remember the whole issue with some of the, um, some of the gaming platforms that had issues with um, with based on ethnicity determining whether or not um, you know someone was was playing a game properly because of the way that they had been developed around um, around sort of general random white people. This is an article that um, that ran recently that was one of those things which which you know you kind of can't even believe it's true but google gave um play gift cards to homeless black people basically in exchange for scanning their face to try to improve um their facial recognition of african americans so again you know racially identifiable just kind of a shocking thing to have happen um so and, and I think a lot of people became aware of this with the Annapolis um, newspaper shooting at the Capitol Gazette. He was identified via, um, via one of these databases that was connected to, um, to government, um, government information. And, you know, they were at his house almost immediately because of the, the images that were captured um, of him in that building that particular day. So it doesn't even have to be your face. You may have seen, you know, the many, many studies about, um, and I think the research study was run by a professor who, who used his own fingerprints and showed that, you know, that using the, the fingerprint sensor to unlock things, you could theoretically do that if you had sort of a high quality image. For a while it was going around, you know, don't make this peace sign, especially if you're, um, an Asian person because they tend to have more pronounced whorls that are more visible in photographs. But, you know, again, as our cameras are so amazingly sharp, this is one of those things that, um, that, you know, seems like it would be more and more of a threat. Now, in addition to, you know, images, another issue is this whole idea of collection of DNA. And this is something which has just been fascinating me. You know, I've, have heard all these cases of people who've discovered that their paternity wasn't what they thought it was, that they had siblings that they didn't know about, that, um, and, and some of these things are happy, but some of them are not, you know, but the, the widespread um, sort of DNA um, extraction of the population at large, I mean, I use this picture from Gattaca, because if you remember from that movie, people with, um, you know, with, what they called the broken ladder. In this case, it was not a genetically broken ladder, but a, a physical ailment, which, um, you know, allowed the one individual to basically sell his DNA to someone else so that he could um, sort of reach a new position. But as it stands right now, so many people have contributed to these DNA databases that most white Americans' DNA can be identified through the existing databases. And this was from last year. So I'm sure in the meantime, they probably filled in a lot of these gaps. And basically, if one of your second cousins has contributed to this, and I know we all have people in our family who have been enthusiastic about participating in these and they want to know their ethnic background or, you know, maybe because of medical conditions. When, when you think about that, if someone that you might not even know your second cousin, and if they've participated in this, then basically they've disclosed enough of your DNA for you to be identifiable. You might have seen there were several high profile cases. One of them was when an unsolved murder was solved because um, detectives 
followed someone to a sporting event and were able to get DNA off of something he discarded. Like he had, I think it was like a hot dog or a drink or something and threw that away. They grabbed it up and did the DNA tests and, and were um, able to link it to DNA, which had been found at this crime scene decades earlier. You may have seen that, you know, this is, it's been proposed to require asylum seekers to, um, in, in many cases, to provide DNA as an identification purpose. But when you think about, you know, the way that these databases could be used, especially when you talk about, um, you know, families and family members being given preference in terms of immigration, there's, there are a lot of sort of, um, a lot of potential issues along with this. And I've noticed recently, now notice I said, you know, that the majority of white individuals' DNA has, ha, are on file. That is not true for minority communities. And I think a lot of that is, you know, well-deserved distrust of, um, of the medical and, um, and criminal justice communities. But if I've seen several ads recently which have been targeting sort of young um, African Americans saying, you know, heritage travel, you know, don't you want to know which country in Africa your, um, your ancestors are from so you can go to that country. So I think they're really trying to fill in this void in their, um, in their data collection by some really targeted ads. And I noticed that there's several organizations that one of them said it's owned by, um, by black it's black owned and it has black scientists running this. So it's trying to give some sort of layer of, of, um, of protection there. So you got, you know, facial recognition, DNA. Another huge thing is voice. You know, I mentioned more than half of search now is via voice, be it via Siri or Google Home or Amazon Echo or whatever, whatever you're doing, Alexa. Um, and, and basically these things are, um, on file forever. And, and the reason around that is usually described as something that is, um, you know, it's still in progress. They're still refining it. it there, it, it's kind of like when you ha get a crash report on your computer and they say, do you want us to, to send this to make the product better? They're still sort of developing these things. And um, there's some huge lawsuits that are going on about the fact that basically they're voice printing student uh, children and um because it, you can see tons of videos online of, of young children sort of interacting with um with alexa or with siri and oftentimes it's around like silly jokes and you know silly requests or um different commands to do just really goofy things. But the idea is that they don't realize that, again, that this information is being kept. And in certain states, you, you do have to have that dual party consent for recordings. So that's sort of how this has been broached rather than, um, rather than saying, you know, it, it's, it's related to um, the Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act. But like it or not, you know, we are in, in this state where you know, you can pretty much assume that you're being recorded at different points in time. This is actually a, um, a device that you can put on top of one of these smart speakers that, um, that, that basically acts as a mute. And I've seen these, this one is, is described as looking like a mushroom, but there are some that, that look like discs too. But the whole idea being that you can physically control and it's not always listening, right? So um, I expect that that will be more and more um, important sort of going forward. But so much of the time we are always connected. There was a wonderful um, article, I think it was in The Guardian last week, and it talked about how people's physical responses changed when they, um, when they knew that their phone battery was depleted. And you may have seen, um, you know, the summer Uber, it was um, it was revealed that their um, terms of service involve the fact that they will hike the rate that you pay for a ride sharing based on the um, based on the battery life on your phone. So if they know that you're down to like ten percent or you're in the red on your battery, they feel like they can charge more for that. This always connectedness is um, you know is is kind of interesting. Um, more and more people are using cameras in their home 
outside their home and more and more people are finding them in places where they have some expectation of privacy. So places like Airbnbs and, you know, some, some hotels, I think there was a hotel in Korea where this was really found to be um, a thing that was going on. But, uh, you know, as, as cameras are smaller and smaller, and now these cameras literally are so small that they can be concealed in a screw in a piece of furniture. It can be absolutely impossible to, to detect them just by, um, by visually sort of looking. This is a heat map of a school. And the reason that I really wanted to include this is because this is something that has been used in my community. Um, when one school system decided to get rid of all their textbooks, they decided to use heat mapping to determine whether or not the teachers in those classrooms were, were using the laptops and the digitized curriculum that they had been by Pearson that they had been provided. So, um, you know, again, this sort of thing might not even be visible to those teachers until an administrator comes to the door to see what they're actually doing if they're if if they're not on their computers, which is sort of sort of an ironic thing. Um, and there is a product, and this was actually um, unveiled at the United Nations, which I just find absolutely fascinating. And I've I found cases of of this being implemented in France and in China, where that are basically using the cameras on computers to tell whether or not students are paying attention. So when you think about this whole idea of the attention economy, and we're going to force the attention economy by, um, by capturing images of, of students as they look at screens, right? You know, it, again, um, you know, where's, where's the, and I love the fact that they say they aren't daydreaming. So, or they aren't daydreaming, they, are, they aren't just off task. It, it's a really, um, a very a very strange way I think to to ensure compliance. You may have seen this summer there were sort of a lot of a lot of stories around um, devices that that purported to to detect aggression. And uh, if you look at how how that. How, the, how that's measured, you know, it, is, it, is it racially biased? Is it gender biased? There's, there are a lot of issues that have to do with that. There are definitely cultural biases built in. But this whole idea that we're going to, to um, give control over, um, over an evaluation that we would have made interpersonally to a machine, I think is, is, is really kind of scary. And of course, you know, maybe maybe less surprisingly, school districts are surveilling students' online lives. Largely, it's said, you know, to, to make sure that they're not um, not threatening their their classmates. One of the high profile cases was when someone put on Snapchat, "Don't come to school tomorrow," and that was interpreted as being a threat that there was going to be online violence or, you know violence at the school distributed online. And um, so again, you know, I, I think that this has been going on for a while in um, my own local district. I know that one student was reported to the FBI for something that he posted on social media. They had contracted with a company without really um, making it public that they were doing that to scan these students' social media posts. There's also this weird device, and, and this has really kind of hit the, um, the news circuit lately as the whole sort of backlash against vaping has grown and the, the realization that schools aren't very good at monitoring that. Um, this, is, this is a device that supposedly can monitor for both vaping and bullying. And I think it's really interesting because it, it describes it as, as decibel level anomalies. So um, they say if you can't put a, a camera or a microphone, use this device, and it will it will you know in the bathrooms or whatever reveal what's going on. Um, you know I would be really curious to to know how well this worked. But you know we've got these sort of always on, always connected students all the time. I know we're all grappling with um, with kids that you know don't want to look up from their phones. I am not often around a, a kid these days that isn't either begging their parents for their device or um, begging for, you know, access to Wi-Fi. 
There's actually a term for this, nomophobia, the, the ability of, of not to be able to connect because of battery life or other issues. And this really sort of interesting app has evolved. And I don't know if you guys have heard about it. It's called Die With Me. Um, the Scandinavian company developed it so that you could only e ever access it when your app, was, when your battery was below 5%. So it puts you into, into this sort of desperation chat room. But one thing I think is really heartening is a lot of people are sort of pushing back against this. And Billy Ellish, that who's, um, you know, kind of a, a team phenom, had a performance at Glastonbury where she specifically said, like, put down your phone, be here with me in the moment, you know, and I just thought that this was, this was such an interesting thing. Um, because there are, you know, there are ways that, that young people have, have managed to evade the sort of always um, being surveilled uh, society. One of those you may have heard, you know, the hot chat for, for, chatting but also for um for sexting from what i hear is google docs and because so many schools or google, google apps for ed schools you know um it, it's something that is provided and they're able to have conversations and and you know unless you're really tracking what's going on in terms of comments uh, that have been erased or things like that it, it may be relatively invisible monica Lewinsky i saw last week is having a big um anti-bullying campaign and she specifically called out Snapchat and some of the other ephemeral social media sites saying that they were rife for bullying. Um, another thing that sort of young people are doing which I think is really interesting is is this sort of um, scribbling of out of faces or putting stickers over the entire faces of individuals this article suggests, you know, it's just a way to, to focus on the positive and not necessarily um, use expression. But I think, I think the facial recognition is another aspect of this. You know, you're, you're really um, hiding from that. You may see, I've seen this a lot amongst preschoolers, this sort of thing, so that if you go to take a picture, they actually are trying to, to sort of foil that, maybe not even knowing that that's what they're doing. Um, Another sort of attempt at, at social stenography is using song lyrics rather than posting sort of first person comments to social media. And I've read that, you know, this is a way for you to express your feelings, but it's, you know, you can always just say, oh, but it's just a song lyric, you know, so therefore you're sort of distancing yourself from the emotional content. Um, Corey Doctorow wrote a really good article about um, social stenography, sort of updating Dana Boyd's um, initial uh, report, which looked at that, and it talked about how the, these sorts of in-jokes are also used in, in countries where things are, are politically uncertain. But I do think we're going to see more and more of a push. You may have seen, you know, there, were, there was a New York Times story last year about parents who were hiring counselors to help them live offline and connect offline with their, their children because so often that had become mediated by technology and that was sort of the go-to. And I remember that article asked the parents to think about what they did as children and to try to, to engage in those type of offline activities with their own children. And, um, and all the parents that were quoted in the article seemed sort of amazed at how well that had gone. I was staying at a hotel last year where I noticed they even advertised their, their in-hotel happy hour as a digital detox. And I thought that was really interesting. And, you know, now we have these places, and this is a fascinating website, the darksky.org. So these international dark sky parks where there's no light pollution. And I think kind of the flip side of this is the thing that young people seem to be the absolute most passionate about is, is this idea of environmental activism. And, you know, whether or not it's, it's Greta Thornburg or, or whoever, you know, they're, they're just incredibly enthusiastic about something that they need to be concerned with, which is, you know, the, the ongoing livability of the planet. You may have read the, the VSCO, the VSCO article that was um, going around a little bit ago about sort of the performative environmental activism that so many young women are engaging in with hydro flasks and steel straws and these other sorts of consumer goods around that. But I do think that climate grief is a thing, right? We have, um, 
you know, and, and this was kind of um, parodied if you watch um, the the t- TV show Big Little Lies that I always get that wrong. I, I always miss one of the words. But anyway, you know, this whole idea that that people are really sad about what's happening to the planet. But yet again, I think there's kind of a performative aspect to it. And, and you really see this on social media. This is um, evidently it's a big thing now if you go to Coachella to buy an inexpensive bike and use it for the festival and then leave it there. So, you know, I'm anticipating that more and more young people are going to be, um, you know, turning their attention to this. And I think if we can, can make that physical rather than virtual, you know, we'll be, we'll be helping them to make an important connection. Increasingly, you know, doctors are prescribing nature as chronic diseases among kids have skyrocketed because of this whole idea of safety and not letting um, kids outside and that sort of thing. And this whole concept of forest bathing, you know, is, um, is, is something that comes up again and again, spending time in nature. If you haven't read the Ginny O'Dell book, How to Do Nothing, I highly recommend it because she really emphasizes the role of connection with nature that has been lost so much in the past few decades. And this is something we can bring into libraries, right, very easily. And I've, I've found, you know, people are very intrigued by, you know, there, there's so few people that have green thumbs when you do have plants and things like that. I think it's, it's an automatic talking point, and I do think it relaxes people. So some of the realities for young people today, you know, they've got this always connected culture, this constant surveillance, data mining going on. They've got kind of a thirst for a fame that they see only happening online. And then at the same time, they have sort of a desperation for exploration and anonymity without it being personally identifiable. So we saw the sort of the aspects of, of social cooling, the way that, um, you know, these things can come back to bite you in ways that you can't anticipate. Approaches to, to um, social stenography that make your message interpretable by those that you want it to be interpretable by, but um, obscure and, and not certain to others. And this whole politicization of presence, you know, if you are in a particular place, does that make you sort of um, associated with a particular group? I think we're seeing that a lot now in Hong Kong. Like I mentioned, this Ginny Odell book, it's just this year, it's excellent. And she really focuses on the fact that the, the people who are the tech elite in Silicon Valley tend to choose schools for their children that are not very tech dependent. And she links this to this whole idea of privilege and the idea that, um, that people who are, have less technology in their lives will also have more aspect to nature and green space. If you haven't read um, Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, lots of really interesting stuff about um, what's going on. And, and I think this is interesting because she says, you know, not exclusively young people, but especially young people, curate their real world behavior in consideration of their online networks. And so, um, so the whole idea that, and I, I, I guess I misspelled a lot of words in this, but, um, but the whole idea of this imagined off audience and how that affects your real life behavior you haven't read American Girls, I, I highly recommend everything by Nancy J. Seltz, but this is a really good book that talks a lot about um, the pressure to conform and sexting and a bunch of other things that have been sort of technologically enabled. And it definitely says, you know, people uh, or this performative meanness on, on social media. Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks. This looks at our um, social welfare systems and how they're using big data to inform what's going on and how so many of the things that can be mistaken for abuse or neglect are really actually reflections of poverty. And so you're really not getting at the root cause. You're really getting at the effect there. Another book I would highly recommend is Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble. Um, and, and this is a book which came out of her own experience in searching for things to do with her young black nieces online and realizing how the search results had been influenced by sort of negative cultural representations of those um, of that demographic. So my key takeaways, um, I think, in, in thinking about this is, you know, surveillance, especially location tracking and facial recognition, is becoming more and more difficult to escape. I wish everybody would go to their phone and turn off, you know, all the location tracking, 
especially when you're not using apps, but even when you are using apps where that is not a critical component of it. If you have to use, you know, find my iPhone or find my Android or whatever, you know, um, you might want to toggle it on and off depending on sort of what, what you're doing so that as you create this, this trail of every place you've ever been, you, you have some control over that. But basically, you know, your permanent record it's no longer just your academic achievement or in your um, and your behavior within the school context, but increasingly for young people, it's got effective financial and physical data points informing that as well. And I think it's necessary for us as adults and especially as people who are sort of information conduits to support and protect young people and give them spaces where they can search and grow and share things outside of the digital space because that's really a part of natural development and inquiry. So I see we have got a lot of comments. I'm really curious to see um, what, what you guys have come up with, but I'm gonna go, go to this one here, which is about um, the, the webinars that are coming up. I'll show this for a minute, Kristen, and then maybe flip back to that last, sure. last sure. slide. So we just, I'll put a link in the chat here that Sounds we good. just wanna remind you that this is a monthly series and if you'll go forward just one slide for a second, Wendy, and then we can come back to you mm -hmm. for Q&A. Okay. Um, that we do have, as you're thinking about your questions and putting them in the chat, uh, if we go forward one slide, uh, Wendy. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. There you go. Um, just so you see what we have coming up, um, I want to highlight that if you are interested in issues of data and privacy, uh, Florian Schaub from our faculty is going to be talking about that on November 19th. Um, he is always in the news uh, on a global scale talking about issues of data privacy and information privacy and sort of the particular tension in libraries. On December 10th, our colleague Melissa Johnson is going to talk about STEM and digital tools. In January, Tiffany Russell from Niles District Library is going to talk about social workers in libraries. February is going to be Colleen Van Lent, who some of you, if you've taken Coursera uh, Web Design for Everybody courses, that's her. She's going to talk about this really critical issue of web accessibility, which is particularly important as the baby boomers age and eyesight changes. And then Mega Subramanian from, from University of Maryland is going to talk about design thinking in the library context. So um, with that, you can go back to questions. I'm just reading the, the chat. There's so many interesting um interesting comments yeah yeah there's i mean a lot of it is depressing and you think like, what do i do go hide in a cave you know like it, it, it's one of those things that i don't um you know I, I try to be aware of things i was telling Kristen, you know before we got started that um there's a pattern and you can download it, um, I think from maybe a Guardian article. And I had a scarf printed with, with the pattern. And it basically looks like little teeny tiny faces, but it also kind of looks just like kind of a black pattern scarf. But the idea is that when you wear it, it confuses facial recognition technology by thinking that you know, there are multiple faces and, um, and that sort of thing. So someone says, I'm easy to talk about this uh, with your own daughter. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of am, am, am happy because I feel like more and more parents are not posting pictures of their, their young children online. And I don't know, um, you know, if, if that may be a rarefied you know, bunch of people or if it's more widespread, but, you know, I would, I think that, you know, until your children can kind of opt in, you know, that's definitely a good move. I would just say, you know, things like the, the finger mustache, you know, and, um, and just, you know, when, when you do in, in making sure that their devices are relatively locked down in terms of not disclosing location information and, um, yeah, I think I think you're totally true. I think today's young adults are going to be more careful with that. And um, 
you know, it, it is it is interesting. One of the things that, that I've talked about in the earlier webinars we did was how valuable the information about a woman's pregnancy happens to be. In those data literacy books we did, I did a case study about a sociologist called Janet Vertici, who, um, who actually hid her pregnancy from social media. Um, and, and basically she was confronted like she was a criminal because she was going and buying um, gift cards at the drugstore to use for big online purchases, which she was having delivered to a post office box. And they really, um, you know, th they said, we're basically gonna have to report you because you bought so many of these, these you know, um, credit card gift card type things that aren't linked to any individual. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating case, but, um, but her point was that pregnant people are very valuable to marketers because they know you're going to be in the market for all these different goods and services related to, to young kids, right? So, um, you know, that, that's, I think, one approach that, that you can take. You know, I, I remember for a while people were like actually looking on Facebook and stuff to see if they could sort of homestead a page for their child. Like they wanted to get a name that nobody else had so that they could get like a unique URL and all that. I feel like that has kind of, as, as Facebook has really come under scrutiny, you know, that, that has definitely been... Um, been been less prevalent at least that at least that I've seen um, so someone said that the evaluation wouldn't open but yeah I think this is one of those things to just talk about and point out you know when you're in a public place and you see a lot of cameras you know point those out and just I would say awareness is a huge part of it you know I mean and um, you know sunglasses and hats and and you know costumes are kind of a fun way to be able to um to to kind of get around and, and evade these type of mechanisms too so okay so kristen's trying the, the link again um well i hope you know i my contact information is pretty easy to find oh okay interesting interesting so as babies look less like infants and more like people then parents are less reluctant to share. And, and I really, you know, I do think that is, that is surely true. Um, but, you know, I, I would, I think awareness is a huge first step. I love the whole idea of, you know, how we have the right to be forgotten. I think we should have the right to be able to move around unsurveilled. And I, I really, you know, the same way that stores can track you as you, as you walk around based on the unique identifiers on your phone, you know, a lot of this, it, it's not even necessarily dependent on, on cameras. It can be dependent, you know, on, on, so I, I personally leave my phone at home and in the car a lot more now than I ever did before. Um, and, and sometimes I just like to, like to go away. And um, so, yeah, people in their twenties liking Instagram store. Yeah. And I think the Instagram stories again, but the, but the issue I think with that is you know as I mentioned with the Monica Lewinsky criticism that I read last week, if it's ephemeral, it, then it's not attributable, and therefore not actionable if there is something sort of wrong with it. It's a really a, a good to, tool for cyberbullying. But um, anyway, I'm sorry I'm sorry that's not working. But um, I'm pretty easy to find on Google <laughs> and uh, and via Facebook. I'm gonna go back. Uh, one slide, Kristen. So uh, that's, yeah. So you can email me if you have anything you want um, to chat about or anything I mentioned that you want more information about. I am on Twitter. I used to be on Twitter before I thought it was, you know, now I think it's almost as bad as, as Facebook and I'm not as active there as I used to be, but I do still look at it, you know, now and then. Um, I don't like the fact that, you know, again, they're trying to predict to me what I'm interested in and I'm constantly having to flip back to the latest first because, um, you know, I, I, I don't want them to, uh, to be monetizing my attention based on, on what they think I'm interested in. Thank you guys. Yeah. The New York Times teacher. I, I love it when I, when I get, you know, ads targeted for very old people or very young people. I, I, and I never provide, you know, correct demographic information for anything, but I always feel successful, you know, when, when that happens and when I'm, um, guess to be, you know, an old man or a very young child or something. So 
Hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you, Joyce, very much. I enjoy that. Um, and like I said, this is something I could talk about for about four hours. I found some notes I had made initially and realized I didn't cover, you know, maybe a third of the things that I had written down initially. Um, and I had to speed up at the end because I really wanted to, to get to the end of the slides. But um, hopefully we'll, we'll continue to have conversations about privacy, especially about privacy in children before they can kind of opt in for this. So yeah, yeah. So um, so there's a lot of other things I've written kind of related, which is which is via um, Kristen's data data literacy project. So um, definitely some related things. Anything else? I think we better wrap it up, Wendy. It's after five o'clock, and I know some people are excited to head home. So thank you to everyone who is here. We will email you in about forty eight hours when when we've posted the archive webinar online. And we hope you'll recommend it to others as well. And we hope we'll see you again next month for Florian Schaub's data privacy session. Thank you Thanks, again, everybody. Kristen. I'm going to close out the meeting.